Thank you, Steve. Thank you, brother. All right, let's fire it up. Good morning, everybody. Uh, glad to be here. Pastor Philip is a friend of mine. Uh, I will make one critical note. I don't mean to start off our friendship on a, a sour note, but uh, pulpit's a little short, and um, <laughs> maybe uh, we can work on that uh, in the future. I do have six children. My wife, Julie, is um, a gift and a joy, and i um, so thankful for our father for giving me her as a helpmate. Um, I do have six children. Our, our oldest is at the Master's University, and he surprised me this morning by coming here, and uh, <clears throat> may the Lord be honored and praised. I love you, son, very much. Um, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The love of Christ constrains us so that those who live, live according to the one who died for us, so that we would not live any longer for ourselves. We have received the ministry of reconciliation. We are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were begging through us, be reconciled to God. The Father is working till now, and so I am working also, and the servant is not greater than the master. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the earth. Let your light so shine so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will become my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. Lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. And we are a holy priesthood, a chosen nation, that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into the kingdom of his Son in the light. How many more times and how many different ways could the scriptures say it than the way it's been said? Brothers and sisters and friends of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is one reason that we remain on the planet. That is to glorify the Son by speaking of his wonderful, powerful, saving grace and going on mission, on a co-mission with him so that the Father is vindicated, the Son is honored, and the Spirit is glorified through our lives being poured out for his honor. He is worthy. He is worth it in every way. In this season where we're planning a church, I've committed to the Lord 100 days of faith, extracting, extracting a promise out of the scripture every day so that we're living according to promise instead of living according to performance. Another uh, commitment that I made is to read a missionary biography a month. I, I don't know about you, but if we're going to live by faith, I need more of it. I need more faith. Would he fill me with faith so that I would believe and commit my purposes and ways to him and for his glory? And to that end, in reading a missionary biography, I want to tell you about John G. Patton. John G. Patton, a missionary in the mid-19th century, was a faithful gospel preacher in a town called Edinburgh, Scotland. He's from Scotland, and he was in Edinburgh, and he was reaching out to the inner city youth, like the homeless, and he was conducting a very prosperous ministry there in, um, sorry, Glasgow, Scotland. He was preaching in Glasgow, and he was there for 10 years, and his ministry was expanding, it was developing, and God was glorified tremendously in all that, but God had a call in his life to go to a place called the New Hebrides Islands. The reason why that was controversial and almost everybody tried to talk him out of it was because almost 20 years prior, two Scottish missionaries, the first ones to the New Hebrides, men named Williams and Harris, had arrived there. When they had arrived, this is now 1839, these two forerunners, Williams and Harris, when they had arrived, they got off of their ship that brought them from Scotland to the New Hebrides. They got into their landing vessel and they rowed to shore. As soon as they landed on shore, the natives came out of the woods. They killed them instantly and ate them before the ship was able to leave the harbor. What a waste. What a mistake. 
They went to go bring the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and these two men, their lives were cut down within moments. They couldn't even communicate a word or any message whatsoever. And the ship was staggered by the atrocity that they observed. So now, John G. Patton, a faithful minister in Glasgow, Scotland, was going to then abandon this ministry so that he could go to this place, the New Hebrides, where these savages <coughs> would take his life. So he and his young wife, they embarked on a five-month sea journey, and it was grueling, absolutely difficult. But they land at this island, <coughs> and um, they begin their ministry. Well, within three months of them arriving, she gives birth to their first child. But she is very ill in the process, and within two weeks, her life is taken. He's now been there for almost four months, and you can imagine with an infant son, he was unable to survive without his mother, and their son died two weeks later. Having left a prosperous ministry, having given so much to the Lord, having sacrificed really everything that he knew, now his wife and his young son are two mounds of earth, these graves that he would visit almost every day in crippling grief. So what do you make of it, John? Do you quit? Do you cut your losses and determine this wasn't God's purpose? Is the Lord worthy of your life and your sacrifice and your wife and your children now that you're alone? Is it worth it? And here are his words. In the pangs, through the pangs of grief, he reports this in his journal. I do not pretend, John Patton writes, to see through the mystery of such difficult visitations, wherein God calls away the young, the promising, and those sorely needed for his service here. But this I do know and feel, that in light of such difficult dispensations, it becomes all of us to love and to serve our most blessed Lord Jesus, so that we may be ready for his call in the day that we, are entered, we enter into eternity. He was not dissuaded. He pressed on because John Patton knew the reason that we remain. Friends, let's go to the text. Open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. Because from the pen of Paul, we're going to discover this purpose and reason for us remaining as Christians on the planet. Why are we still here? Why are we not taken instantly to heaven the moment that we are born again? Paul reveals to us this reason for us remaining here on earth with such interest and such intrigue. I want to show you this paragraph. Philippians 1, 21 through 26. Paul helps us to know the reason that we remain. Philippians 1, 21 says this. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, well, that will remain fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose. But I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet, to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus, through my coming to you again. Now, pop quiz, here we go, kindred. Where was Paul writing from? He was writing from a? He was writing from a prison. This is one of the prison epistles. And which prison was he writing from? In what city? He was writing from the city of? Rome. That's right. So he was under house arrest in Rome. He was a prisoner of Caesar. If you go back to Acts 19 and 20, you see the backstory of all of this. It's absolutely fascinating. Do you know that the Holy Spirit testified to him when he was ministering in Asia? Actually, he had gone to Europe. He was ministering throughout Europe. The, the Holy Spirit testified to him that he should go to Jerusalem, be arrested, and appeal to Caesar. You see, Paul, because by virtue of the fact that he was a Roman citizen, had the capacity to appeal to Caesar himself and to gain a hearing in the presence of Caesar. And so he went to Jerusalem, was arrested, and then he made his way to Rome, eventually and writing Philippians and other prison epistles from his Roman imprisonment. 
on his way, we're going to catch this a little bit later, he stopped and was a prison, prisoner in a little town, uh, town called Caesarea Maritima, which was the coastal city that Herod the Great had built so that they could run ships from Rome to this area of Palestine. So Paul was now in Rome waiting to appeal to Caesar and hold on to that detail more on that later. But let's start here in verse 21, a colossal claim. Paul lays down this colossal claim for our lives in Philippians 1.21. And if you've been a believer for more than a short time, I would hope that you would be aware of this verse or even have this verse as a memory verse that marks your life. What is his colossal claim in Philippians 1.21? For me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Let's take each of those one at a time. What does it mean to live is Christ? It's kind of an unusual statement. It's not to, to manifest Christ or to honor Christ. He says to live is Christ. What does Paul mean by to live is Christ? What Paul means to say is this, that he has marshaled all of his abilities, all of his capacities, all of his interests, all of his desires, he's marshaled all of them to render them over to the lordship of Jesus Christ so that he is manifest in every part of his life. So if you were to see Paul speak, you would think Jesus Christ. If you were to see Paul work, you would think Jesus Christ. If you were able to see Paul's thoughts, you would think Jesus Christ. To live is Christ. You would do well at this point because I know you want to be a doer of the word and not just a hearer of the word. You would do well at this point to take an inventory of your life and ask the Lord to show you what aspects of your life fall short of this colossal claim. Does your speech not glorify him the way that it should? Does your attitude fall short in some ways? And we all fall short in many ways. We need to be self-critical through the power of the Spirit so that we can determine how, our, determine how our lives can be more like Christ so that He is put forward at all times and in every way. Stephen Olford says, all my life, all my energies, all my time is His. That's how your life is Christ. But let's be a little bit more practical about that. If you're wanting to apply this principle and to understand a little bit better what it means to have your life being Christ, I want you to write down three thoughts, okay? What does it mean to have Christ as our life? First, abide in Christ, John 15, 1 through 11. Remain in him. Commune with him. Hey, young people, devote your time and your energies and your future to him. Abide in him. Enjoy his presence. He's given himself to you. Believer, you are found in Christ. In fact, Christ is our life. And if Christ is our life, then by all means, let's enjoy and relish the privilege of abiding in him. Abiding. The branch should abide in the vine. Letter A remain or abide in Christ. Let her be, if you want to have your life is Christ, let her be manifest Christ. Romans 13, 14 says, why don't we put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh? Put him on. Put him on in your business. Put him on in your sports. Put him on in your parenting. Put them on with everything your hand finds to do. Do it for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ and put him on and manifest him. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ, his righteousness, his patience, his goodness, his mercy, his, his humility, his truth, his power, and his wisdom. Listen to me. What a privilege. What a thrill that we can put him on. And all of these resources have been poured out to every believer. Abide in him. Let her be. Manifest him. Let her see promote him. And so again, we are a holy nation, a royal priesthood. 1 Peter 2, 9, so that we may proclaim the excellencies of the one who delivered us out of darkness and put us into the kingdom of his son in the light. 
Proclaim his excellencies. Promote Christ. <sighs> What's better than that? I mean, think for a moment. What could be more fulfilling in time and in eternity? What could be more satisfying? What could be more thrilling than to know the full power of the Holy Spirit in a life that is yielded over to him? To live is Christ. Abide in him, manifest him, and promote him at every, with every opportunity that is extended by his sovereign purposes. To live is Christ. That's colossal claim. To live is Christ. What's the second part of it? And to die is gain. This is the second part of this colossal claim that Paul throws at us here in Philippians 1.21. To die is gain. Gain, the Greek word kerde, means profit. So after all of the expenses have been accounted for and all the revenue has been taken in, businessmen, right, what color of a number are you looking for? A red one or a black one? Black. We're looking for black. We want to be in the black, all right? In the red, no es bueno. That's not going to work very well for us at all. Red is uh, in the negative. Ex our expenses exceeding our revenue. And you function in the red. Uh, our government should know this better than it does. If you function in the red long enough, it's, it does not going to go well with you. And so, but J Paul is making a point about his death not being lost, but his death, he, he knew that his death would be gain, profit. He was so excited to die because he knew at that moment that all of life would be cashed out. Everything that he had done would come to fruition. He strove so that he could run as an approved servant so that he would have a reward. He yearned to know the pleasure of the Father. And because of that, and because his life was Christ, he knew that his death would be gain. It may be, friends, that you confess Christ, but are still fearful of death. Do you know in Hebrews that you have been blessed with the privilege to no longer fear death because of your assurance about what awaits you? I pray that the Holy Spirit would lead you into the scriptures, into the life filled with his presence so that you would be assured and have the confidence of the hope that Christ offers to you and that you would not fear death. So believer, if you don't fear death, any longer, then prepare for that eventuality. The mortality rate is still holding at 100%. <clears throat> it hasn't changed in several generations. I told Gus, the man in the shuttle that was taking me to my rental car yesterday, I said, I, I just warned him. I said, Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that is the judgment. I said, Gus, will you be ready for that appointment which is hastening your way? And we had a good conversation, and I've emailed him about a church. He lives over in Temecula, and I've told him that I was here this morning, but he's working, and so I don't think Gus is here. But um, I told him about faithful churches where he can learn and grow. My point is this. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that we may be re recompensed, repaid for what we've done in the body, whether useful or useless to him. This is Paul saying that life when your life is Christ, your death will be gain. And this is our abiding interest that you would take up a life that is Christ and that you would press into having more of Christ manifest in your life so that your death would be gain. Todd and Connie, your testimony is so compelling to us. I mean, you are so vulnerable and honest. You're like, a couple years ago, not on my radar at all. I mean, I wasn't on that plan whatsoever. What honor for you to recognize that in yourself and to be willing to share that. Connie, praise God for your faithfulness and your winsomeness with your husband, for you to be led by the Spirit to say, this is an us thing. This is for us, you and me. And that winsome grace in your life was so overwhelming to your husband that in a matter of a short time, he's like, I got it. We can and we should and we will. And your life has pivoted towards mission in a dramatic way in a couple of years because of your faithfulness to yield to his purposes. What a beautiful example of what it means to take up more of Christ being manifest in your life. It's so easy for us to think, well, I, 
I, I give a testimony when I can, and I want to be faithful with my resources, and consider this level of obedience as being a check mark in God's eternal economy. But that's not the way it works, because he's called us into all of this, and he has equipped us and prepared us for such a life so that Christ would be manifest in every way, and that we would then anticipate death as gain, riches. It's over. It's for your glory and for your honor. Young people, if I could have your attention for a moment. I want to underscore what was said a few moments ago. There's nothing more valuable or meaningful than a life rendered over to Christ. And if you were to take a moment and to ask someone that you respect that's no longer a young person about the greatest values, those that know Christ will instantly say, living and honoring, living for and honoring him. And may it be true that you wouldn't go through some of the foolish or wasteful steps that some of us endured in our youthfulness so that you could press in from your youth into what it means to live as Christ and to die as gain. Is God calling you to the new Hebrides? Is God calling you to Paraguay? Didn't he say it beautifully? Paraguay. I was like, Alejandro. I was like, come on. Paraguay. Uruguay. I was like, what? Man. Paraguay. I don't know. What about uh, Chet and Katie in the Amazon? Uh, we, don't, we don't for a moment. Did they mention their deprivation one time? They didn't. Did they mention their sacrifice one time? They have given up so much to do what they're doing, and they do it with joy, and the reward is in heaven. Their life is Christ in a beautiful way. I'm so thankful for them, and their death will be gained. This is a colossal claim. So, friend, how about you? In what way do you want to shore up an area of your life? Maybe you take abide in Christ, manifest Christ, promote Christ. Maybe you choose one of those as a way for you to apply your life being more like Christ. Choose one of them now. God's calling you into this life that is Christ so that your death can be gain. This colossal claim is for every believer. Let's take it up and enjoy it. But now Paul transitions to a curious quandary. In verses 22 through 24, he highlights this very unusual choice, this very, very difficult and seemingly mysterious choice. What choice is he talking about? Let's reread verses 22 through 24 so that we can face Paul's curious quandary. Philippians 1, says this, For to me, sorry, that's verse 21, 22, But if I am to live on in the flesh, that will mean fruitful labor for me. But I do not know which to choose. Huh. But I'm hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Pause there. This is Paul's curious quandary. What, what's the last word in verse 22? I do not know which to choose. What's the noun form of choose? He was facing a choice. What was Paul's choice? It's actually a little bit difficult to determine what Paul's choice was. He says in verse 23, uh, choosing between these two directions. I don't know which to choose between these two directions. Huh. What was Paul choosing between? What and what? Between life and death. Interesting. Paul was choosing between life and death in what way? Was Paul going to commit suicide? No, by no means. Well, again, let's go back to where Paul was writing from. He was writing from a prison in what city? In the city of? And what was his purpose in being in Rome? Was to appeal to what person? Caesar. So Paul, any moment, was awaiting the knock of the door. Maybe uh, there were Roman soldiers who probably didn't even knock. They just burst in. They would grab him, and they would take him to Caesar. Any moment, he could be called to give his testimony to Caesar. And that was his whole point of being there. And in the presence of Caesar, I'm suggesting to you that there were two different ways that he could preach that would secure two different outcomes for his life. There was a way for him to preach faithfully that would lead to life and ongoing ministry, and there was a way for him to preach faithfully that would lead to death and his martyrdom instantaneously. Well, you shouldn't take my word for it. <laughs> I want to show you this in the Bible. So let's go back to Acts 26. In Acts 26, we see that Paul is in Caesarea Maritima. 
So I mentioned that city. That was a place where he was in a holding cell on his way to Rome. And there he was preaching uh, as, well, he always was preaching. What a great example, always preaching. And may we always be found preaching, always, always preaching. Well, Paul was always preaching, and we're now in Acts 26. He had preached to Felix and Festus. They were local governors. And now he's preaching to a man named Agrippa, who was the regional king. So he wasn't like Caesar. He was under Caesar, but he was the, 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 the leader or the king, King Agrippa, of the Decapolis. And so that was his region. So Paul had been giving testimony to Felix and Festus. Now Acts 26, we're going to go to 28, verse 28. He's now preaching to King Agrippa. And what was King Agrippa's response? Well, look at here in verse 28. Agrippa replied to Paul, after Paul had preached this entire sermon about the glory of Christ and the need to be converted, Agrippa then says, in a short while, what does he say? You will what? Persuade me to become a Christian. Agrippa's like, time out. Okay, hold on. No, no, no. You need to stop because you're so persuasive. You're so winsome. Your argument is so tight. What you're saying is so compelling to me. I'm telling you to stop because you're almost persuading me to be, me to become a Christian. Extraordinary. Look at the last verse in chapter 26, verse 32. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man might have been free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Now, how many of you think that Paul's preaching in Acts 26 was faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ? Okay, a few of you think that it was faithful. Great, great. Because the rest of you, if you thought otherwise, would be incorrect. Paul's preaching, faithful. It's recorded by the Holy Spirit for us as a model of what it means to preach faithfully for the glory of the Son. But he was so winsome and compelling, Agrippa was ready to let him go free. He didn't want to go free. He insisted on going to to Rome and to preach for Caesar. And then he says, look, you're so compelling. You're so gracious. You're so thoughtful. Uh, I need you to stop because you're almost convincing me to become a Christian. So this is an example of preaching in such a way that's faithful that would lead to what? Life. Lead to life. Well, is there an illustration of preaching in a faithful way that would lead to death? Let's go to Acts 6 and 7. So earlier... Almost immediately after the days of Pentecost, the church is stirred up and preachers are going forward. Stephen, who is a deacon, a faithful preacher as well, uh, was brought in to, uh, under a council of Jewish leaders. And what, look at chapter 6 and verse 15. What does it say about their initial perception of Stephen? It says that they, it appeared to him that, they ha- that he had a face of a what? Now, is this a good start or a bad start? I mean, do you think, I mean, look, I mean these Jewish leaders are like, yeah, he, this is a guy coming in. He preaches Jesus, which we hate. We hate him. We hate what he's doing. But I got to be honest with you, this guy's kind of like an angel. I mean, that was a good start. I think from that vantage point, it would be really easy to be like, hey, here's the thing. Jesus is the Lord, but, you know, kind of thing. And pull the Paul card, which is life. That is not at all what Stephen does. Stephen loses his mind. He goes prophetic on him, and he lights him up. I mean, the entire seventh chapter, he starts in the first few words, and he goes right at him so that we get all the way to verse 51. So he's preaching throughout the whole chapter, and this is a taste of his fiery proclamation. Acts 7, 51. You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit, and you're doing just as your fathers did. Okay, there you go. All right, those are fighting words, all right? So um, he has transgressed the line of winsomeness, and he has gone full profit on them. And uh, how do they respond to this? Verse 54. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. Wow. And you know what happens. You know what happens. Verse 57, they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed at him with one impulse. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. (laughs) Let's vote again. How many of you think that Stephen's preaching was faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ? And his preaching led to death. Both are faithful. Both magnified Christ. 
Jesus commands us in Matthew 10, 16, that if the sheep are to survive the wolves, we must be as innocent as doves and as shrewd as serpents. Isn't this illustrative of faithful ministry, that it can be done different ways and different times for different purposes? And Paul was right here in the crosshairs of this choice. For me to live as Christ, I love that. To die is gain, I love that too. And I'm not sure which one to choose. Because if I remain on, Philippians 1, you can turn back there. If I remain on, it's fruitful labor for me. And and opportunity to to exhort and partner with you in your growth. But what does he say in Philippians 1.23? But to depart and be with Christ. What does he say? What's the last phrase in verse 23 by Philippians 1? To depart and be with Christ for me, he says, is what? very much better. It's a compound construct to accent how for him, going and being with the Lord Jesus Christ was the very best of all conceivable scenarios. And we'll be with him so soon. May God put within our hearts the urgency and the need for immediacy in mission. To be with Christ is very much better. We do have six young people in our home. They all think they're invincible. They'll know soon enough that time is short and opportunities are limited to bring glory to the Son. See, for Paul, again, departing being with Christ is very much better. It says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, it says, and when he calls us to be with him, we will be with him always. Can't you feel the joy and thrill of being with your Savior always, without interruption, in his perfect and loving and gracious and kind and humble presence, always, to spend a thousand years and ten thousand more in his presence. Can you imagine him thrusting his arms open and saying to you in a spirit of jubilation and victory, well done, my good and faithful servant. Can you hear it? Can you hear him voice the words, well done, good and faithful servant? Because the truth is, not all Christians will receive such a commendation. Because not all Christians are good and faithful servants. And I fall short in many ways every day in selfishness and pride and self-interest. But may the Lord help me all the more to run to to the finish line and to sprint and to surge towards the end. In this congregation, there are many, I imagine, who have the privilege of being at retirement or close to retirement. What will you make of your retirement days? Robert Moffat, a Scottish missionary, says this, we will have all of eternity to celebrate our victories but only a few hours until sunset to win them. Isn't that right, Todd? (laughs) We're going to be home so soon. And he's saying, I can't wait to be in his presence. But if I remain the life choice, fruitful labor is for me and for the glory of the sun. So which one am I going to choose? That leads to a concrete conviction here in verses 25 and 26. So, Paul, what of it? You have this choice, life and death. You're trying to figure out what will be best. So which do you choose in the moment of your appearance before Caesar? Philippians 1.25. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all. Do you hear what he's saying there? There's almost a sense of, uh, well, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for the progress and joy of your faith. That's it, right there. That's the reason that we remain. The reason, believer, that you 
remain. It's for the progress and joy of the faith of others. And for Paul, he was referencing these missionary endeavors all over the known world. In fact, he wanted to live so that he could go to Spain, which had never been reached before. He had a personal mission to go where Christ had never been heard of before. And he wanted to promote this in every corner of the known world. And this is the emphasis of this day for you. Oh, what Christ has done for us believers. He died to give us an example of death to self that Paul takes on here. See, Paul's personal interest was to die and to go to heaven. Paul's like, I'm, I'm setting aside my personal interest to put forward the glory of Christ and the benefit of others in their faith. How can you do that today for the glory of God? This is Mission Sunday. How can you set aside your personal interest for the glory of Christ and the benefit of souls, many of whom, in some cases, have never heard of the Lord Jesus Christ and his saving grace. In a few moments as we approach our end, I want to exhort you to apply this in a specific way. Again, you're a faithful, Bible-loving church. I'm going to exhort you to apply this principle of denial of self for the promotion of Christ and his glory in a few moments. But for now, consider all that Christ has done for us, all that he has sacrificed. Imagine him on the throne in eternity past. Myriad times, a myriad of angels coursing around him and singing his holy praises. Them knowing perfectly the contours of his excellencies and proclaiming at great length and without end how wonderful and perfect he is. Reigning over the universe from a position of power and might as judge and creator and king. And he gave it all to become a baby, a baby a baby and and to walk think of the life that he lived lived the son of man did not even have a place to lay his head he was mocked and scorned and when it all came down there were a few women and a guy or two what he gave up And the son, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he humbled himself and took on the form of a man, becoming the likeness of a man. He emptied himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Oh, that he, what he has done and then what he has provided for us. He's provided for us forgiveness and his righteousness. This is the gift of justification. Our sins are never to be remembered again, and we take on the righteousness of Christ. He has changed our desires. He has given us a new heart, taking away the heart of stone and giving us a heart of flesh. He has made us a new creation. He's given us all the blessings found in the heavenly places are ours today. He makes us partakers of the divine nature. He's changed our identity. He's given us a calling. He indwells us in the form of the Holy Spirit, and he himself is our advocate and paraclete. And the Father is up in heaven, resourcing us in every imaginable way to glorify the Son and to be on mission. He is with us even to the end of the age, and the Holy Spirit himself is our gift, Acts 1, so that we can go be his witnesses. Take up your mantle and live this life committed to the joy and progress of the faith of others for the glory of the Son of God. This is our privilege and our calling. May the Lord help us to come to clarity that this is the point of our life and the reason that we remain. May he convey by the gracious and loving and merciful work of the Holy Spirit this is our mantle. This is our victory. This is our grace. And for the believer that imagines that the Christian life is different than a life on mission. They're living an impoverished life indeed. Spurgeon says, there were either missionaries or were imposters. 
And to be a missionary, you can do so in your home, the joy and progress of your children. You can do so in your neighborhood, the joy and progress of your neighbors. Within your family, at work, at the store, on the flight, have a spirit of expectation that the Lord would allow you to do this regularly and frequently, day by day by day. And may he help me to know that every day that I don't in some way or multiple ways forward the glory of the Son through this message, I'm missing the purpose for me staying here. This is such a joy-inducing theme. It's my hope and prayer that it rests on your heart with joy and a spirit of inspiration. So much is before us and so much opportunity is at hand. I mean, you've been blessed all morning. Hopefully, some of you were here for the earlier hour so that you could participate in some of these activities. Hopefully, many of you will stay forward, uh, stay afterwards for the barbecue and to allow this theme to kind of settle in a little bit as we're challenged practically to think of ways that we can participate. Hopefully, you're jotting down names of these missionaries that are on the screen and the missionaries are actually in the service. So here we go. Let's be practical with how you can apply this for the glory of God. Friends, I would encourage you before the Lord to have a philosophy and theology of your own personal interest in the Lord Jesus gaining worldwide spiritual domination. To say it more simply, what are you doing in international ministries? I would exhort you strongly. I believe that the Holy that our Holy Father will hold us accountable for what we did to those outside of our community related to missions. So a couple of thoughts. First, I would encourage each of you to express interest in an STM. I'm confident that if you express interest, there's no commitment today, there's no hard sale on this, but it's possible that virtually all of you could maybe go. But even if you don't go, you're in the know, you're supporting, you're praying, and you're supporting them by your friendship and your partnership. I would encourage each of you, every one of you that considers the Lord Jesus Christ as the king of their life, to consider just expressing your interest in STM, even if that means encouraging, supporting those who go ultimately. But another way that you can apply this, find someone who's on mission in a way that you can't be. Maybe, again, because of your career or your place in life or you have children at home, et cetera, et cetera. Find someone who's on mission in a needy place in a way that you can't be and hitch the wagon of your resources to the horse of their enthusiasm. I mean, again, they're, they're in the room. They're all around all weekend. There are these testimonies of ways for you to connect. There's lists of these people that are readily available for you. And I'm challenging, encouraging each of you to find a way to get connected with an international ministry, maybe one that you know or even one associated with the church so that you can know, pray, and support. <clears throat> Think for a moment of how lonely some of these leaders are that are giving so much <clears throat> and sacrificing so greatly. And to have an email from one of you that you're praying for them, a note, a thoughtful gift, a way to support. Can you feel how far that will go to put wind in their sails in doing something, being on a foreign mission field that you can't do today? Two ways that I'm exhorting you to apply this, STM, sign up and express your interest, even if it means supporting, praying and knowing, even if you're not able to go. Secondly, Find a missionary, someone who's on mission in a way that you can't be, and hitch your resource wagon, time, prayer, encouragement, finances, to the horse of their leadership and activity. John G. Patton, faithful man. He did remain on in those islands for many years. In fact, the first island that he was at, he was chased off that island after six years violently because all of the tribes rose up against him uh, to take his life. And so he left that island initially, but he was undeterred. He traveled in Australia, in America. He also went back to his uh, homeland of Great Britain, and he brought the message of the need. He was married again and went back to an island called Aniwa. He then remained in Aniwa for uh, almost 50 years, and he was faithful in his ministry there. Even though he experienced mountains of suffering, 
repeated attacks of fever, pneumonia, and delirium. He was brought and his life was challenged by the natives many, many times and delivered miraculously. Massive setbacks. Other children died. But here's his testimony. Quote, I claimed Aniwa for Jesus, and by the grace of God, Aniwa now worships at the Savior's feet. Okay. You can have a similar testimony in your eternal account by your encouragement, prayer, and support of those that are in places like Aniwa. And if you're wondering after all that he suffered and all the ways that he faced difficult and challenging situations, here is his testimony at the end of his life. As I lay down my pen, let me record with immovable conviction that his is the noblest service in which any human being can spend or be spent, and that if God were to give me back my life to be lived all over again, I would, without one quiver of hesitation, lay it on the altar of Christ, that he may use it as before in a similar ministry of love, especially among those who have never heard of the name of Jesus Christ. God gave his best, his son for me, and I will give my best, my all, my life to him. And kindred community said... Amen. Amen. Father, we love you. Your spirit and your son are compelling to us. We want to know your purposes in all of this. And we would ask that you would help us be magnified and glorified. Be pleased, Lord. Help us to know how to apply this. And if your application is different than what has been offered to them, then you apply it to their heart such that your son is magnified because that is our highest and most esteemed end. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.